So I think we can go ahead and get started and let people trickle in. So hi, I'm Kim Hamilton Duffy. I'm the executive director of DIP, DIP the Decentralized Identity Foundation. And with me, I have Otto Mora from Polygon ID. And uh, we're really grateful that everyone joined. This uh, credential schemas is a little bit of a dry topic. So i um, very glad that you're engaged with it. And we're gonna have a few polls throughout to um, you know, sort of learn more about how we can um, tailor this to your interest. The agenda is we'll just quickly talk about decentralized identity as a refresher or intro if you've not heard of it before. We're gonna talk about some use cases for decentralized identity, which will lead us to um, the relevance of credential schemas. Then we'll walk through some proposed schemas, including ones that have been donated. And um, we'll describe working at DIV, which is where the work item process will happen. And then uh, lastly, we'll open up to discussion and we're trying to leave plenty of time at the end for discussion. So let me send out a poll to get started. Uh, one second, this is my first time doing polls. So um, yeah, you're my test subject. So can you see the poll? Yep. Okay, great. So yeah, just take a second or so to fill it out. Everything's optional. And if you're just joining us, we're doing a, a poll to ask uh, what, get more information about uh, what people's role is, what sort of areas are interested in, and um, um, how familiar you are with decentralized identity or SSI. So I'll give another minute and then stop the poll. Okay, this seems good enough for scientific uh, results. <laughs> so um, I will, I guess, end it now. And looks like we have quite a few advanced people, but we are gonna stay at the beginner. We're not going to assume advanced knowledge of it, but we've tried to tailor the talk so that um, we can keep keep it very um, sort of what's relevant about decentralized identity to schemas and the overall discussion. So um, I am not sure what you're seeing right now, but in theory, I'm sharing the results. So uh, can you still see my slide deck? Yep. Okay, great. Sorry, I'm totally new to this. So, okay, I'm gonna stop sharing that and we'll go back to the deck and Effectively, decentralized identity, the way I define it is a set of technology standards and principles that provide individuals with control over their digital identities and personal data. And the principles is important because, you know, a lot of us on this call, in fact, spend a lot of time on the first part, the technologies and standards, but those are always an imperfect way of encoding the overall goal. And we have to work closely with um, regulators, uh, policymakers, things like that to ensure that all of the, the goals or the sort of probably um, unattainable ultimate platonic ideal of the goal we're trying to do here, but uh, continue to work towards um, providing individuals with control, privacy, agency of their per digital identities and personal data. And uh, this has been an issue for a while. It's something that's coming up more and more, um, especially lately. And so we wanna do what we can to give people privacy, agency, the ability to uh, uh, exert control. 
And so why does it matter? There's a lot of reasons why decentralized identity or SSI are, are why we work on it, why we consider it valuable, the privacy, security, um, the, the fact that it can establish bi-directional trust. So online, when you interact, when you're sharing a lot of data, it's for organizations to put trust in you, but that bi-directional trust isn't there. We as, as consumers or individuals are still very prone to phishing attacks and all these out of band kind of communications um, that, that are not trustworthy. So a lot of the technologies we're talking about are really focusing on that critical advantage. Um, Streamline onboarding, I've highlighted this one because that's really a practical benefit that we're gonna focus on in this webinar. But I think what is really exciting about these technologies, standards, and the, the principles is that ultimately we're trying to open doors to new economic and social opportunities and the ability to transform lives. So for example, um, alternative forms of credit assessment say if they could be uh, based on reliable uh, proof of payment history, all these forms of digital credentials that could provide you with markers of, of trust and increase your opportunities. So we're with that, um, we're going to move on to the use cases. In general, after each section, we're going to leave some time for, for questions. So actually, I'm going to look at the chat and see if there's any sort of pressing questions right now. Okay, I'll keep going, but keep in mind that we will be breaking for questions in between. So some use cases that we're interested in as part of this new decentralized identity foundation work item include KYC, KYB, which you know your customer, know your business, AML, anti-money laundering claims, and then lastly, age verification. So ensuring age appropriate access to services and content while minimizing the amount of information disclosed. So just keeping it to the bare minimum that needs to be proved, um, whether it's over 18, 21, et cetera. And so again, in orange, we're gonna focus a bit on a use case of KYC, KYB in the context of decentralized identity. Some current challenges in KYC, KYB, and uh, I've adapted these from, from Check's blog, who is actually working in part of this working effort. And so high costs, the traditional methods for customer onboarding are very costly. It's a known impact to financial services, so costs and um, time inefficiencies, the amount of time it takes to perform this and have people on hold while they're waiting for this diligence and then the complexity of complying uh, or of ensuring compliance with um, all these different um, regimes that, that are needed. This is something that's challenging and very resource intensive. Um, let's see. Okay, so there's a lot of information chalked into this slide. So, um, you know, we're not getting into too much detail on how it works in a decentralized identity context, but the the uh, so the highlights of that in decentralized identity there are issuers of credentials there's subjects or holders in our case it's going to be the same so that's the person who the credential is about and who is holding it and then we have a relying party or a verifier and that's who you're presenting it to so for example say if we have an issuer that could issue a KYC check and then they're issuing it to me, the subject. So I, I also hold it in my credential wallet. And then I could go share it with a relying party, which might be a new financial institution that I want to do business with. So in this flow, the, the, the flow starts with the subject requesting a verifiable credential from the issuer. The issuer validates the request, does any diligence needed on the subject and then issues the VC, turns it back to the subject. In step three, what happens, the typical flow would be I, the, the holder of the credential, would go um, you know, pursue, say, I'm in, equivalent to opening an account with the relying party. But the relying party says, wait, 
show me a verifiable presentation, which is one or more verifiable credentials in whole or in part. And then my wallet or agent, so wallet you could think of as just, you know, your phone with your store in your, um, uh, like your Apple wallet kind of thing. And that will have software that helps you retrieve the verifiable credentials matching that request. It'll package them, sign a response, and send it back to the relying party. Um, that is a, a very quick intro to how decentralized identity flow works. The most pressing question that you may have is, so how is trust established? Why would this relying party buy this credential that they're getting directly from me? So the underlying the underlying um, ability to enable trust is, is provided by these trust frameworks, and they provide the anchor for verification procedures, regulatory compliance, and jurisdictional alignment, say this matches the KYC um, uh, regime in the US versus you know some other country. Um, and it ultimately enables establishing trust in the ecosystem. So these trust frameworks are a combination. They're enabled by standards, and um, but the realization of them is a network of participants who abide by these trust frameworks. And that underlies these ecosystem. That is why the issuer issues a credential that the relying party can ultimately accept and, and know who to trust. Um, the other part I want to call out is that, you know, how is, how is a verifiable credential different from, say, a government identity document or MDL? So in the KYC case, you can think of it as your government identity doc or these other feeder documents go into the process and the process um, is is aligned with this trust framework, and then um, the issuer is, is performing this process. The issuer, their delegates, performing this process, and then they output this verifiable credential that's exchanged um, in this in this ecosystem. So that's a very high level view of how trust works, and that's an area of, of very active ongoing uh, development. The benefits of this approach in the KYC, KYB context, and, and I, I know it's why many are on the call, this is something that we're seeing a lot of market interest in, is cost reduction. And again, um, I've adapted from Check's blog, but they've observed the ability to slash KYC, KYB verification costs um, up to 90%. The convenience for individuals is really important. So instead of re-requesting all of the information again and again, it sets up these flows where it's sort of like, you know, from a relying party perspective, they can act as a digital concierge. They basically, the, the customer just shows up, presents the data that they approve of, they consent to, and then it, it instantly unlocks an experience that's customized to them. And they didn't have to fill out all of these forms. Um, the other aspect is that um, it, it's uh, drawing a lot of attention and its ability to uh, align with uh, regulatory requirements. And uh, you're seeing this happen throughout the globe. And that's, that's an area of continued, um, but very active development. Another reason is that people are very um, appeal, uh, what appeal is the ability to avoid vendor lock-in. So the idea that um, you are not actually, you know, whatever sort of credentials, um, the your whole verification or onboarding um, process is not bound to just one vendor. And then of course, there's the robust privacy aspects um, in the, the decentralized identity context whether it's through the credentials themselves or privacy preserving signature suites like zero knowledge proofs. Privacy is in, in very important in making sure that only the data revealed is what's absolutely necessary. And then lastly, these approaches are future ready in the sense that they align with emerging global standards. So we're about to get to the, the meat of it now with that introduction. I don't see any questions in the chat. Anything before we move forward?
Okay, I will turn to, oh, actually, sorry, I do have another poll. Okay, so in this one, you know, if you're not very familiar with decentralized identity, keep in mind all of these are optional, but what we're getting at is in your opinion, what is the most impactful use case for decentralized identity? And there's an opportunity to select other. We're really interested to know what is your single answer. And then also, what do you see as the single biggest challenge to adopting decentralized identity solutions? And it's okay if you, you know, to both of these say, um, you just don't see a need for it. That's, that's all very useful information. Okay, I think I'm going to pause it in about 10 seconds. Okay, now I'll stop it and we'll see what we got. So a lot of enhancing privacy, security, streamlining. Um, oh. Let's see, and I'll share these afterwards. So some really good answers. What do you see as the single biggest benefit or, or challenge, lack of awareness, understanding, concerns about regulatory compliance, and then also we'll look at the other. So yes, overcoming reliant party attachment to legacy identity infrastructure, and also the importance of um, SSI as an island is not useful. We need the ecosystem and um, yeah. So this is really fantastic stuff. Um, we will move on to the credential, why credential schemas matter. Actually, Otto, is this where you're taking over or is that me? Yeah, yeah, that's where okay, I'm jumping. Perfect, well, um, I'll just say to move forward when um, you're ready for me to move slides, so. All right, perfect. Sounds good, go ahead. Yeah, so um, as, as uh, Kim was saying, uh, we're trying to enhance interoperability and, and reusability, but in order to do that, we need to have consistency across uh, the different credential ecosystems, right? So uh, first going over like, what is a schema, right? A schema as, as uh, shown here is sort of a template which specifies which attributes a credential should contain along with what type of field each credential would contain, right? Whether ones are date fields or numbers or strings. Um, so that all goes into defining what is a schema. Um, it also uh, has, you know, kind of interpretation and use uh, connotation to it as well. So, you know, some schemas will have more detailed information than others uh, for certain particular use cases. And uh, the main idea is that we have consistency and interoperability, right? So um, the schema that I create is sort of this Lego brick with this particular shape and this other schema with another credential uh, ecosystem, maybe a, a different Lego brick, but we want to try to have interoperability by having the fields that each of them is using be consistent. And so that gives us more opportunity to create uh, sort of reuse and interoperability as, as Kim was describing earlier. Okay, so what you can see over there in the screen is just like a little table format, um, what we call like sort of an abstract schema format, uh, which has like the field names, the description of each field, the type, and whether each field is uh, required or optional and some additional comments. So 
that's sort of the the base uh, from which we begin. And uh, then we'll show you later a little bit of how we're thinking of kind of implementing this on each of the credential ecosystems. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so as, as was mentioned, uh, credential schemas do help establish trust in an ecosystem, right? They boost efficiency. Um, they also facilitate innovation, right? Which is sort of shared language, which enables innovators to focus on creating new applications rather than having to kind of worry about how schemas are compatible with one another. So enabling interoperability, right? Um, and so having this reference as as uh, as to what fields to use creates, you know, uh, better chances for for reuse and so on. So, um, you know, so best practices as well can be uh, shared, uh, kind of, you know, from from our schema library, which uh, also promotes discoverability, convergence, right? Everybody's using sort of the same schema format, um, and also having a clear idea of what the purpose of each schema is uh, also helps us to kind of just in general enhance trust. All right, moving on to the next one. Another important piece, um, as I was mentioning earlier, is sort of what the data model or the generic abstract data model is versus the specific um, sort of implementation in each uh, format or ecosystem, right? So from the abstract data model, which is this sort of table format with the field names and the description, we would then have a particular folder in the repository reflecting how the particular data model is implemented in a particular ecosystem. So for uh, the case of Polygon ID, we use JSON linked data, uh, credential schema, so we would take that abstract data model and then implement it onto a JSON LD file. Also taking into consideration whatever like limitations we may have, you know, we may certainly have to readapt some field names or some the length of some fields and so on. So each credential ecosystem would also have sort of its own limitations. And then similarly for check, in the case of check, they support for both um, uh, JSON web tokens, JOTS and JSON LD. So they would have their own kind of implementation to it um, as well as, uh, other formats, such so as OpenID, which they support uh, select disclosure, JSON web token, or SDJOT, they would have sort of their own adaptation of this abstract data model. And so, you know, by having this abstract data model that kind of keeps the main reference of all the fields, we keep sort of a, a main idea of what all fields should be there, but then we are able to adapt it to each flavor of each specific uh, ecosystem. And so this gives us uh, sort of a good starting point um, to maintain sort of consistency. And then, you know, other ecosystems can come in and add their own kind of flavor implementation to it, to the folder. And so that's kind of how we're thinking about uh, working on um, kind of maintaining this uh, consistency across the ecosystems. All right. Uh, so jumping in here uh, into our proposed, first off, like on that particular question, maybe, yeah, I just wanted to pause there. Was there any question around the credential format and how we're gonna manage that across the different ecosystems or does all of that make sense to everybody? I don't see any in the chat. So um, anyone, if you have questions, feel free to add them to the chat and we'll tee them up. But otherwise I think you can keep going. All right, perfect. Yeah, oh, okay. So now going into what specific schemas we wanna work on. Um, this is the sort of initial list, right? And we're always um, going to be attentive to other folks in the group bringing in ideas as to which schemas they want to prioritize. Um, this one is a, sort of a basic KYC model that we're starting with, uh, which is sort of just like the base set of fields that you need for uh, identifying a person for KYC type purposes. Um, and then this one, we're actually donating from Polygon ID. We've created this schema with uh, the help of various KYC issuers in our ecosystem. Um, and it kind of aligns with all of these standards that you see out there, OpenID Connect Core, OIDC for Identity Assurance, the EPC uh, sort of natural person schema. So we've collected all of that and created this basic KYC model. And the idea is we're gonna donate to the Decentralized Identity Foundation. Um, then also put it up for feedback from the group and and kind of enrich it and, and kind of standardize it and, and kind of contribute it to the to this effort. Um, also, there's another one which you think is highly relevant for proof of humanity. 
uh, being able to prove that a person is a human and kind of having a standardized credential for that we think is relevant, uh, as well as proof of age, which is something that is also becoming more relevant as more legislation kind of enforces, uh, you know, persons needing to demonstrate their, their age online. So we think that'll be, that'll be a, a relevant one. Uh, and then finally, another one that I wanted to highlight is sort of this any money laundering or sort of sanction list check uh, type schema uh, that we're going to work on. And then this one, I just wanted to call out the fact that the folks from Checked are very graciously also contributing uh, some of the good work that they have been doing in this space onto this effort. So we'll be able to leverage that as part of the, the work on this uh, work item. So those are the schemas that we're thinking about working on. And I did see some questions. Um, let's see from Pat. Yes, there is one about the, um, so on slide 15, let me go back there. So the question about how Polygon ID interoperates with the other two, in other words, does it have to map to this table format? And I'll, I'll just give a quick, answer. Um, so basically, you can think of this as the payload. And all of these is sort of, um, maybe I'll call them disposable envelopes. So in general, what would happen is that um, each would, uh, you know, the, the sort of envelope would be a way of establishing trust, and you would rely on a software library or other means to, um, to sort of uh, verify that it hasn't been tampered with, that it's from who you would expect. But then this abstract common data model part could be reused across. So um, um, Otto, do you have anything to add on that? No, I think you got it. You hit it on the head, right? The, the abstract data model defines all the base fields that you would use. And then as you said, sort of uh, adapted to each sort of format uh, or, or structure, right? depending whether it's JSON LD, VC JOT, or SD JOT, and so on, right? We have some more great questions. So next is Richard Esplin, uh, how do these standard schemas relate to the work at schema.org? Um, uh, so part of the, the let, let me pull up, actually, we talked about the alignments. Um, these are the key alignments for basic KYC, for example. Um, we have starting point proposals for these two. And then in the case of KYC, there ends up being these sort of well-known alignments. In general, the way that, that also one, there's the proposed, the donations to DIFF, um, the participants in the working group will, so what, what checked in Polygon has done is say, you know, this has been useful for us in our ecosystem and they develop them according to these alignments to establish that they're fit for, for purpose. They can, you know, use them useful for real world scenarios, but then it's a good time to bring it into a standards org for further, um, you know, sort of refinement. So, in, in general, from here, people in the working group will be part of its evolution. Now, speaking to the sort of schema.org question, I know in general, what I do when creating a schema is, you know, figuring out what are, what are the sort of correct alignments for it. And then say like in the case of, you know, if it's something new that there's no obvious alignment, then schema.org tends to be one of the first places I go to uh, check for alignment. So um, Otto could probably add more on, you know, the sort of, if there's anything in context he wanted to add. Yeah, I mean, I think that, so the other thing is, uh, I guess in the beginning version of this, we would just have our schemas out in a public GitHub repository. Uh, but we have been getting some feedback around uh, facilitating discoverability, maybe some kind of a schema explorer, which would be kind of similar to schema.org. And, and that is something that we're we're open to discussing and, you know, potentially having some sort of diff credential schema explorer in the future could be something that I think would be interesting as well for, for facilitating kind of navigating around the various schema formats and searching them. And then Don, Shepard asks, is the abstract data model being used elsewhere now or is it new? So a couple of things, um, the, the, okay. So 
again, the, the KYC schema, the schemas being proposed or being donated to DIF are very valuable in that they're actually ones that are being used and adopted in the wild. So they've already done a lot of work with say, you know, from a compliance lens and, and will someone use this? Is this a valuable, does it have the necessary information to serve its function? So that's a lot of, um, you know, sort of benefits in that, but as part, all companies will will generally develop it, not necessarily from, most companies will develop it not from a standards lens, right? Like they'll develop it for their use cases. And so like the abstract data model, this is sort of the idea that we want to reverse engineer the abstract data model from the specific implementation of it. And this is partially informed by lessons learned along the way. When, when people propose a schema that's maybe overly tied to some underlying stack, especially in today's world, when you wake up every day and there's a new verifiable credential format to support, we just know from um, um, uh, many battle wounds that the way to start is through this abstract data model, adapting it to the different specific formats. That helps make keep a cleaner separation make sure that technology specific quirks don't leak their way in and cause you headaches going forward. So I would say that the abstract, the content of the abstract data model is in use. Um, this is just more of a scheme of best practice that especially with the proliferation of credential formats, um, we're just going to have to be um, more disciplined about and keeping that separation. Um, we have uh, one more. Yes. So about the trust models, I think we'll get to the, let's get to the next section on scope, which will tee that up. Um, Otto, were you done with this slide? Can I move to scope? Yeah. Yeah, you can go ahead and move. Yeah, I think this next one is is sort of relevant. Um, what what uh, Gerald's just bringing up about the, the trust framework, right? Um, we are thinking of referencing trust frameworks for relevant, but we don't necessarily want to tie the definition of each schema to a particular trust framework necessarily. Um, so we're going to keep that, you know, relatively neutral. But you are free to reference any trust framework in in sort of using any of these, you know, standardized schemas. I think that's the generic answer. Don't know if you want to add more there, Kim. Yeah, um, I think the the big thing about how, you know, my experience and how these discussions work would, you know, say as a work item would be first you need to, first the work working group will need to establish what use case are we even talking about? Who is in, in very clearly call out who would be a representative issuer, who would be using this credential? Because if you design a schema without thinking about all of that, you're going to miss, you know, you're just going to design something in a vacuum and it won't necessarily be useful. So it is helpful to get that broad lens. And in some case with the donated uh, schemas, we have a leg up because they've gone through some of that diligence. But in general, with the working group, um, there's a lot of work up front to figure out what is that use case. Um, knowing how the verification process would work and what would be the rough shape of trust frameworks that would need to be aligned with, those are very important informative pieces to the work. Um, we do want to design it so that those um, aspects are not in scope. So for example, this working group, the working group at DIF that would focus on the schemas are not going to be discussing what is the optimal verification process going in a KYC credential or what are the frameworks that, you know, how do we align with this specific trust framework? So, you know, we want to understand the general shape of it to the extent that it affects the work that we're doing. And that's very important to establish up front. But then once we sort of get the scope clear and, you know, document that key information, then the the group can can focus on the development of the schemas and and those are iterative as well. The things that do need to vary and do need to be in scope have to do with extensibility and customization. As we know, whatever is developed is is not going to be um, you know sufficient for all use cases, and so 
There's common extensibility hooks. Um, some examples of those include a framework for what I call, you know, from the software terminology of globalization, localization, the idea of taking a, a thing like a KYC credential that will need to, um, you know, it is slightly different depending on the jurisdiction. And so what is the kind of abstract form of that, the globalized form and then localized? How do you adapt it to a specific jurisdiction? Um, so these are the kinds of things that would need to be in scope. Um, we have more questions, which is great. Uh, thank you, Seema. Uh, she probably dropped already, but. Okay, uh, Marie has a good question about whether reusable KYC is practical in the short term and we'll, we'll get to that. Um, and then there's uh, listing to actual trust frameworks. So yes, um, actually, and we will get to both of those. I'm going to do the last section on working at diff. And I encourage anyone to drop in your trust frameworks. I know for sure there's a lot of people on the call that are experts in developing this. So I'm going to just give a quick overview of working at diff. We're a Linux Foundation project, and we're part of the Digital Trust Initiative, which includes groups that I know many of you are familiar with like the Trust Over IP, Open Wallet Foundation, C2PA, Hyperledger. These are our friends. We all work together on establishing digital trust. And so one of the advantages as with many of these organizations is that they're protected under W3C patent policy. And diff in general, just a quick introduction. We, the kinds of activities include structured collaboration. So this would be, um, you know, whether it's uh, uh, working groups that are focused on developing documents, requirements, use cases, things like that, or if they're developing technical specifications um, or reference implementations, we um, allow the sort of innovation to occur in a IP safe way. And in general, we allow industry coordination and the ability to network and learn from all of the leading experts in, in the field. For This is the general work item process at DIP overlaid with our specific, um, work, the, the specific work item we're talking about here. We're in this phase of identifying the participants and priorities. So we're uh, starting off with a really strong set of participants um, in, in that's informed by the donations as well including uh, auto from Polygon ID and checked. And uh, we're looking for other people who would be interested in joining. The next step is that the proposed schemas, any proposed schemas are submitted to the DIFF claims and credentials working group. So um, that's just sort of the starting point schemas that would then be undergoing ongoing development in the, uh, in the working group. Then where the bulk of the work happens, sorry for my formatting, is that the group then refines and uh, revises. So, oops, sorry. Um, so we, in this group, we plan to meet bi-weekly and, uh, and or, ace, well, asynchronously as well. So part of working at DIP in a working group is um, we add you to Slack, you can comment in GitHub. So all of these ways are supported to continue moving forward on the goal. And we refine the use cases, refine the goals, alignments, and we make progress on the schema proposals. Our plan is to work one at a time and um, you know, pick one of, of priority to the participants and move those forward. And then when, when that gets to a good spot where the participants feel like it's a, a good, you know, not necessarily that it needs to be perfect for all time, but that it's good enough. They see that it's their purpose. Then the working group, it moves to working group approval phase, and then finally to um, diff approval. And then these can be revised over time. This whole thing can be um, re repeated. And I'm going to put up a poll actually, because so the, the schema priority is informed by participants in the working group, but we're also interested in hearing which schemas you all are interested in. Um, so here's the information about joining DIFF, and you can contact us at, at this email address. 
And for this working group, we are for this work item, we are targeting into May start date Wednesdays or uh, biweekly, sorry, at, at this time. And we have some other information about staying informed with the community. We'll send out an uh, email with all of this information. We're interested, if you're interested in participating, but these times don't work for you, we're interested in hearing that as well. Um, I'm going to tee up a slide and or slide a poll. And while I do that, um, Otto, feel free to scan through and see if there's any questions that you want to mm -hmm. add. Yeah, I think there's a there's a raised hand from Dimitri. If Dimitri wants to jump in and thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to say that the 11 a.m. Eastern is um, the same time slot as the Verkhov Crunches working group call, uh, which, you know, I realize picking time slots for these is ridiculously hard, but just as a data point. Oh, wow. Uh, this poll is not good. Ignore question one. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Um, but questions two, questions two and three are good. Mm -hmm. but did you hear the comment from Dimitri about the time for the? Yes, I'll make a note of that. All right. Yeah, we'll we'll align on what's the best um, best use or the best time. Yeah, and actually, let me be more concrete in this call to action. So, do email this. Um, address this email address if you're interested in participating. Dimitri, I know how to find you, but in general, um, email me here if you're interested in joining this. We'll send out a poll of availability for um, for the regular working group. So I'm just going to make a note here. So it's, it's with the DID working group, right? All right. Dimitri, was it the DID? Uh, the, it was uh, the VC 2.0 working group. Oh, VC 2.0. Okay. Okay, sorry, I didn't catch that. And I'll, I'll update the diff calendar as well. The, the other thing I think is worth mentioning here is that, uh, that there, there's varying shapes and sizes to credential schemas, right? So uh, we've sort of defined one, we're saying that this is what a basic KYC schema looks like. There, there could very well be what an advanced KYC schema look like, right? So just like to use a kitchen analogy, like there's, there's knives and then there's butter knives right? Or then there's like sushi knives, right? But at least we both agree on what a butter knife sh should look like and what a sushi knife should look like, right? So that's sort of the, the idea here, right? And I guess over time, we'll, we'll see how the, the different uh, schema standards for different purposes evolve. That's a very important call out that we didn't get to in terms of, um, you know, if you think about it in terms of the levels of assurance, I like the butter knife, sushi knife better, but, you know, uh, when you come to industries that are highly regulated, there's a different set of concerns, of course. One thing I noticed recently that TBD and Block is, is doing is a proof of customer credential. So there's all kinds of, you know, interesting credential types that we're seeing uh, people are finding value out of. Um, but it's actually really good to see that um, uh, there's... The mo well, maybe it's because we also, uh, these polls are not scientific, I realize that, but you know we did brand it as reusable KYC. Um, and so, but good to see a lot of participants are interested in that. I'm gonna end the poll. It looks like the um, answers are trickling off. And I do wanna get to, uh, I love the spicy questions. There's the, is this valuable at all? And thank you people for bearing with my question one, I don't know what that was, but um, okay, so, oh, I meant to share results. So how, oh wait, um, what credential schema? So KYC, AML, a lot of interest in that. Then KYB, proof of age, proof of humanity. Um, let's look at the other credential schemas. Known customer credential. So yeah, that's exactly what uh, TBD is finding value in. And this is great schema for verifiable product related sustainability information. 
And then we have what best describes why your customer or why your company is interested in credential schema. So technology providers, compliance, innovation, and then future proofing. Okay, fantastic. So let's see what other questions we have. We The rest of the time is for Q&A. So I'm gonna get to uh, Marie. So, okay, oh, actually, I, sorry, I missed the context on it. Uh, you said, Marie, do you wanna speak up? Sorry, apologies, I was on mute. Um, yeah, no, I, I guess what I was, so, so reusable KYC is like um, trying to do brain surgery when we are just learning to do sutures. Um, and I just think the that we can get 80% of the way there by having reusable components, because all the KYC processes, um, KYB, they, they have fundamental components that they all use. They have a proof of identity, it might be certain types of identities they support, it might, and then they have different processes and different due diligence and different, that, that they kind of, that they apply then to that information. That last mile, that last 20% is the stuff that's really, really hard to codify. And that is what prevents other companies from reusing credentials issued by one KYC process if they don't really understand exactly all the steps. So it's kind of one of these things, we can get 80% of the way there by getting all the components credentialized. And then the last 20%, we might get there at some stage in the funeral, but I think that's a really, really hard lift. Um, that's my experience. Absolutely. And that's a call out. That's a distinction we didn't call out, which is that this approach can be used in that way. So there does, when we say, when we talk about these credential types, we're using shorthands to say, what is the goal of it? But it doesn't need to be the single credential that a relying party accepts and says, you know, I, I take the, I completely take this issue as word for it. I completely agree with their processes. And, you know, because that is very rare that that happens. What we're talking about is the ability to shave off, you know, tremendous um, amounts of, yeah, or, you, you know, big fraction. The way there. Yeah. And yeah. then you can codify the last 20%, so you can automate it. But it's just the, if you get to the 80%, you can automate the, the last 20%. Exactly. Yeah. So I think we're definitely on the same page with that. Um, and then let's see, can get a diff, get compliance practitioners. Exactly. Um, yeah, and that's one of the benefits of how the donated schemas have evolved is that they've been developed, you know, hand in hand with compliance practitioners. And we are um, getting, we're, we're targeting the um, we're targeting what's different about this effort. So, and why we've pitched it the way we have. I know in general with standards groups, they tend to get the technical people and then sort of work for it in a vacuum. Um, in our case, we're trying to really focus on the use case first, and that includes the broad lens, um, the, the compliance experts, people who are building products, not necessarily the technical folks starting with, um, that will come later, but that is part of the design of this working group because we all know from our experience um, how important that is. Otherwise, these credentials aren't going to be accepted. So, totally on board with that. Yeah, Any? I would like to. I would like to reinforce that. Yeah, that's true, right? Like in our case, like we built them collaboratively with folks that were previously KYC issuers and that had been you know, doing this day to day and, and it makes sense. And I think it should be the same for any other use case, right? Like I'm not gonna be claimed to be an expert in hospitality. I might bring in somebody that's already been doing hospitality to create like a guest credential or, or things like that for hotels and so on. Um, I think that's absolutely uh, makes a lot of sense. And, and thank you for pointing that out, Kim. Yes, can I ask one quick question, Kim? Sorry, just I made the mistake yeah. of talking. One more question to ask. Earlier on in the call, you mentioned the point, or somebody mentioned the point about discoverability, which I completely agree. And, and I guess one question I have is there is the discoverability of the schemas to say, you know, these are the schemas that have been defined by these standards bodies or, you know, whatever the community might be that's defined particular schemas. But there's also discoverability which I probably would argue is even more interesting, which is 
what are the schemas and who is issuing credentials to those schemas and who is accepting credentials of those schemas? Because that, at the end of the day, your decision on what schema to use may not be because it's the best scheme on the planet, but it's just the one that everybody and their grandmother is using and you just want to get into the, into the marketplace. So have you thought about that particular problem, which I think is the Absolutely. interesting one? Yeah. yeah, that is actually the the most important thing. And, you know, we decided it would be a little too cheeky to add a, a, the sort of registry part with only one schema. But that is very important from my, you know, many years and many people's years of experience in this is like, you want someone to take the first stab of it, because all it feels like anything you do in this space, you're just sort of designing schemas, looking to see, looking to see like prior art and everything. And people want something to, you know, start with. That's why schema.org is so valuable. And in the education space, like uh, credential engine registry, things like that. Um, what we need more of is the idea of sort of the value, the benefits of convergence, um, you know, and interoperability enabled through just people deciding like, yes, that one was easiest to find, I'm going to use it. And that's not to say like, we, we want the sort of, you know, diversity of input, we don't want to put our thumb on the scale too much. But there is, there's a huge need for some form of curation at this point. And I think that's something that DIFF is really interested in pushing forward. So um, we're, I think we've informally targeted that as a thing to think about after, the, you know, sort of after the first schema is well underway and we're sort of, you know, building confidence and that's moving forward. So yeah, totally agree. Yeah, because I just want to just follow up on that because I would say like schemas will be issued to multiple trust registries and that sort of discovery point is, is really what's going to ultimately drive which ones win in the end. So I think it's super important just because at the end of the day, I mean, because it's, and also it, it also helps convergence as well, because I remember during COVID, we all built, we all built systems during COVID and literally you couldn't throw a stone, but you hit a COVID pass or you hit a, you know, they all, and they all were different. Um, so I think it's, but anyway, it's a really interesting problem to solve. I think if we can solve that one, then we have the, the holy grail. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, to the extent that whatever early one is not going to be perfect, the ability to evolve them over time um, is really important as well. And absolutely. so- Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, yes, oh, sorry, go ahead. I know no, no, you've got answers on trust framework, so go ahead. No, I just wanted to add that, uh, yeah, like what Mary's pointing out is very important, right? Like just as I, I as a developer, I go and look up a JavaScript library kind of they all do the same thing like which one do I choose right like I would go to maybe the see the number of stars on the github repo or some other indication signaling mechanism to see yeah I should go use this one um, so that's something that has been pointed out in schemas as well as schema standards uh, from our conversation at IAW as well and I think that would be something that we definitely should have in a future sort of discoverability platform that diff hosts to kind of have each individual either issuer or, or company do like some kind of, you know, uh, favorite or attestation saying that I'm using or I'm accepting this schema format uh, to, to facilitate that discoverability. Yeah. Thank you. And so we have a lot of great responses to the trust framework. Thank you, Richard. This is actually a really good list of them. So I think we're gonna share these in the notes as well. I didn't catch any other questions. Does anyone have anything else to add? Hey Kim, it's Daryl. So, just want to say again, I'm going. Oh yeah, sorry. Can you? Sorry, I, I'm I'm driving, but uh, Kim, great job on this. Um, I would, I would reiterate one of the comments that Marie made, which was regards to reusable KYC. Um, the term itself is extremely loaded. We may want to, to Marie's point, to I think how you raised it as well, is talking about components for reusable KYC or component credentials for reusable KYC or something so people understand the model that we're looking at. Um, I love that. Yeah, go ahead. Second comment is... Um, 
when we we talk about much along the lines of you had you know the use case how you're starting with the use case and then getting into the bits and bytes with the tech people after you've understood the use case we also need to make sure the developers aren't thinking hey if i pick this schema format i'm good to go they need to understand this gets into levels of assurance that you know there is stuff behind that there is, you know, business processes. I know we don't want to have a have a prescription on on how you, you know, verify and find identity right now, but they can't just nakedly pick a, a credential and think it's going to work. They need to understand the business context under which one can issue it and one can consume it. Really good call out, and that's another important role of a registry, and you know, sort of tagging it with all these considerations, but then also yep. there's a huge messaging part of it as well. I We all yep. know from experience. And so I think that's gonna be an exciting opportunity here. Yeah. And oh, then yes. last, one, one last point, Kim, is you, you've mentioned registry. Now, is DIFF looking to build the concept of a registry, meaning build some software that one another group could run and operate? Because every trust network is gonna have its own specific needs. So that diff becomes the hey, here's the questions that are asked. Here's how they are asked. But you go run that thing yourself. But here's the here's the specifications by which you will make sure you are interoperable. Or is diff looking to host that thing? We're still talking about what form that would take. So if you're interested, cool. uh, definitely let's talk. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure Marie and I have ideas. Great. Thanks, Kim. Great work. Thank you. And, you know, regarding the term, um, I ha I have to admit, I just took the term that's trending and used it to, um, you know, like ah, that kind of describes what we're doing. And so, oh, it's, it's, um, it, it's important. It's important to grow, <laughs> growth hack it. Totally. Exactly. So, um, yeah, all of us have struggled with terms for a long, long time. And so, yeah, I'm very I agree, though, we need something a little more nuanced. Um, oh, Cam, good question. Uh, we didn't get to that. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention during the talk was the idea of, um, you know, in some cases for these sorts of, well, in general, not just for these, but the enhanced digital identity, identity efforts that are happening in general, some national chains are getting concerned about the ability for law enforcement to then uh, demand that, that these chains turn over records and correlate people's activity. I think that that's uh, an argument for decentralized identity technologies and principles. Um, in that sort of minimization and, and help, you know, it's not just a simple problem. There's a lot of work that goes into that, but that is, that's one of the most interesting um, questions that are coming out of this um, sort of increased digital identity and correlation. And we have a lot of questions, but we're at time. And thank you so much for this great conversation. Um, just really thrilled that we got such a great group of people here. We'll be sending out the slides and the, the poll results and do reach out to me if you have anything you want to, or if you want to participate or any questions, or comments. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Otto. Thank you. Bye-bye.